So it falls to me to introduce our speaker today, Jamala Rogers. And because she has a pretty extensive career and uh, list of activities, I need a cheat sheet, which I'm going to read from. Um, I also want to point out that there are a couple of other events that I don't want to forget to mention, but I'll come back to that. Um, Jamala is an award-winning community activist and author with more than four decades of experience organizing for racial justice and gender equality. During the 1970s, she helped found the St. Louis chapter of the Congress of African People and was involved in the African Liberation Support Committee and the National Black Political Assembly. She's a founder and past chair of the Organization for Black Struggle, which was established in St. Louis in 1980 to work on issues related to repression, electoral politics, youth, education, and the cultural arts. She is the co-chair of the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression, and has been deeply involved in the struggle for racial justice in the wake of the police killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson. She's a prolific contributor to websites and blogs and a featured contributing writer for the St. Louis American. 20 years of her columns were collected and published as the best, way, the best of the way I see it and other political writings, 1989 to 2010. Her latest book, it looks like you might even, if you're lucky, and uh, approach her right, get a signed copy uh, for a price. Her latest book is Ferguson is America, Roots of Rebellion, which chronicles the long-standing fight for racial justice and human rights in St. Louis. And this semester, she's here in Madison at in the spring as a Haven Center activist in residence which is a program that was made possible through the generous contribution for, from the Link Friendship House. So with no further ado, Jamal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the hospitality since I've been here. I know you couldn't do anything about the snow, <laughs> but I'm loving you anyway. Uh, so we're going to get started, and, uh, and hopefully we will have a energetic and robust conversation afterwards. What I want to do is to use some data from Dane County and from Wisconsin to really jump this conversation off. And so when I say this man of racism is central to a democracy, we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. But suffice it to say that indicators of quality of life are part of any democracy. And so when those aren't being met, and in fact they are deliberately being denied, then we don't have a democracy. So I like to think of what we have in this country is an experiment that ain't quite working, y'all but we're going to make it work. So let's get started. Uh, a lot of the data that I'm using comes from race to equity. Mm -hmm. And some of you all probably are familiar with that group. Uh, help me out. The Wisconsin Council on Children, Children and, families. and Families. And so, um, I think there were a number of partners in there, but they seem to be the main folks. So we're going to start off with the fact that, you know, Dane County has a little over 323,000 people. Um, million people, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> the white population is 77%, and what I found interesting is that's up from like uh, five years ago. So it was 72, so it's getting whiter, y'all. Um, the African American population is 13.8%, and then um, all of the non white populations are about 10%, and they constitute Asians, Native Americans, Latinos, and Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. So you just want to just sit on that for a minute in terms of what those demographics looks like and what they might say to us. There's a couple of people here from the book signing last week, and so they know that I love this quote from uh, The Road Not Taken and the Shaping of America by Lone Bennett. He wrote this in 1975. And basically it says a choice, a nation is a choice. It chooses itself at fateful forks in the road, 
the nation and the people who make up that nation are defined by that fort and by the decision that was made there, as well as the decision that was not made there. So the decision, once made, engraves itself onto the landscape, engraves itself into things, into institutions, nerves, muscles, tendons, and then the second decision requires a third, and it goes on and on until the process finally distorts everything and alienates everybody. So the thing I want you to remember throughout the slide's presentation is at what point were we at the fork in the road and we could have done something different? So we're going to start with a working definition of racism. Because sometimes, oftentimes, people conflate individual acts of prejudice with racism. And in fact, sometimes people accuse folks of color who are oppressed as being racist. So we're going to get clear on the fact that racism is the belief that a race is superior to others and holds the power to promote and enforce those beliefs through a system of educational, financial, social, religious, cultural, and political institutions. So all day long, I could not like you because you eat peas, but I have no way to enforce that because I don't have any control of those institutions. Democracy. Does anybody know where that word comes from? Greek. So demos is people, and uh, kratia means power. So what, you know, that's such a beautiful word, those two things together, because that's actually just a powerful combination. So democracy for me is when the majority of the people decide what's best for the majority of the people, and that's based on equity, fairness, and justice. So you don't get to choose who gets to be part of the democracy. So folks that are trans, folks that are differently able, folks that are darker than you, you just, just all of us get to choose, and all of us are responsible for each other, and making sure those rights are protected and respected. So one of the interesting things I found out about Madison is that the medium household income is $54,000. Now, now, to me, that's a lot of money, y'all. So, so folks here are living quite comfortably. It's, it's all right. So the census tells us that over 54% of American, African Americans in Dane County live below the federal poverty line, compared to almost 9% of whites. So that means that blacks were over six times likely to be poorer than whites. So that $54,000 a year income means nothing to most black folks living in Dane County. So there's a 13 to 1 disparity ratio between that poverty level and it is listed as one of the widest black-white child poverty gaps in any jurisdiction in the whole damn nation. There, there's some seats up here, you all. I'm not going to bite. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. It was a natural break. <laughs> came in, we were going over the fact that the median income for uh, Dane County is $54,000, uh, but that six times blacks are uh, six times more likely to be poorer than whites, uh, and that there's a 13 to 1 disparity ratio for black, white, child poverty, uh, the highest in the nation. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you all a snapshot, because I know y'all understand that Wisconsin is sort of supposed to be the sort of liberal um, place, but we have to figure out what the disconnect here, why these things have been allowed to happen over generations, and what, what we have to do about it. 
So some of you all might be aware of the data, and I'm almost sure some of you are, <coughs> but you know, we're going to put it all together to see what has to be done. So in the Madison Public Schools, there is a 50% on-time high school graduation rate for African-American students compared to 85% for white students. And in Dade County, uh, public schools, a black student is 15 times more likely to be suspended than a white student. <coughs> this last uh, fact here, Wisconsin has the highest gap in every test category. That didn't come from uh, the record <coughs> report. That came from another little report on Madison, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee called Fulfill the Promise that Wisconsin has the widest gap in every test category. And as a former public school teacher, that's very troubling. <coughs> so in 2011, the official unemployment rate for blacks in Dane County was 25% compared to 4.8 for whites. So in other words, African Americans were five times, five and a half times more likely to be jobless than their white neighbors. The latest uh, arrest records of 2010 said that the black youth were six times more likely to be arrested than whites. That's three times the statewide ratio and twice the national ratio. So again, Wisconsin, we're not looking good here. So the county stats also cite that African-American adults were arrested at a rate more than eight times that of whites. That's four times the statewide average and two and a half times the national. So we way up there, y'all, way up there, above everybody else. In 2012, African-American males make up only less than 5% of the county's total male population, yet they accounted for more than 43% of all new adult prison placements during the year. Wisconsin is number one for the worst incarcerate for African American men in the country. And I have to pause here, you all, because uh, a year and a half ago, I was here and I gave a, a presentation. Uh, Patrick, I think that was 2015 that I was here. And after I had seen the rates and people had actually verified it, I almost deputized people to say, when I come back, you all are going to have this straightened out for me. And everybody assured me that they would. It's, it's not happening, y'all. So somebody's getting a bad grade here. <laughs> so in essence, Dane County blacks generally fare less than African Americans living anywhere else in the state and in the nation. I'm, I'm going to let y'all sit on that for a minute. Blacks <coughs> in this county fare less on all the quality of life indicators than black people living anywhere else in the state or the nation. And I'm including Mississippi in that, y'all. Worst of Mississippi. So I want to talk a little bit about where I think this comes from and where we are in this country today and why it's so difficult for whites to shift. Uh, and actually for, for non-whites to shift to is because in many ways it goes back to I'm going to read this from uh, this is from some of you all were too young to remember this but there was a Kerner Commission report that yes. came after a wave of cities went up in flames in 1967 and the commission report was to figure out why were black people so angry in almost every urban area across this country. And so this is one of the infamous quotes from me. 
Our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And what white people have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white institutions created the ghetto, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. That's where we are even in 2017. Elsewise, some of these stats wouldn't be as bad as they are. So I'm gonna, these last few are just a run through about some facts. Sixteen million students go to schools that employ cops but no counselors. Why is that? Because most people think black people are criminals. Milwaukee's 53206 zip code is the most poorest zip code in the state and has the highest rate of incarcerated citizens. Why is this allowed to happen? Because people think black folks are criminals. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left, some of you all were part of that, and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or blacks, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalize them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. That's from John Ehrlichman, who was an uh, advisor to Richard Nixon. So Y'all see where this is going? This is goes to the highest echelons of our government. And not only was this messed up, um, because it went without very little opposition from both, I mean, you know, black folks were the victims of it, but very little opposition from organized white people, anti-racist folks. This actually became a policy that other uh, presidents used. For example, uh, Nixon, I'm sorry, Reagan used uh, drugs to pay for the Contra War. And so bringing drugs into the communities, it was from, from Nixon first doing that. And why is that happening? Because black folks are criminal anyway. And to me, the part that's so insidious about the, the marijuana, we know that that policy <coughs> then fast forward to the 1980s and 1990s, that the disparity between crack cocaine uh, and, and, and cocaine sentencing was like way off the charts. And it took like, you know, damn near 30 years for that to be corrected, in spite of folks knowing that it was a disparity and an injustice. In the St. Louis, for sake of all report, there was a 35 plus years difference between life expectancy and two zip codes. You could live to be 91.4 years in 63040, or you could live to be 55 years in 63140. So I know you're a smart bunch of people. What, what do you think is the racial composition of 63040? <laughs> White. And 63140? White. All right. So, so what does that say? It doesn't make any difference because black people are criminals. So we, we've got this stuff isolated down to zip codes, y'all, where we can tell exactly what's going on. And my living in Kenlock is going to take 30 years off my life. And folks are okay with that. Something's wrong with that picture. University of Oklahoma Sigma Alpha Epsilon Frat was caught on tape singing a song that included the N-word and the lyrics, you can hang him from a tree, but he'll never sign with me. <coughs> Why is stuff like that allowed to go on the campuses? Because basically, black people are criminals. I'm going to end with what I started with. And that is, there's choices along the way. I share with people, um, I went to a book signing right here on this campus with uh, Michael O'Meara. He wrote the book, Wisconsin Sentencing. 
in the tough old crime era. And he points out, as, as does Michelle Alexander, that in 1973, there were about 2,000 prisoners in Wisconsin jails and prisons. 2,000, y'all. I got more Facebook friends than that. So what would have happened had we done some intervention in 1973? And now your <coughs> incarceration rate is 10 times that. The road not taken. So I'm going to bring this to a close by us answering a question or getting ready to answer the question that, um, that I want to be the starting point. I facilitated a post um, screen discussion of uh, what was the name of the do not resist. Do not resist, and it's the militarization of the police, and because they had a lot of scenes from Ferguson, uh, I, I felt obligated and honored to, to do that. But one of the first questions coming out the box was from somebody that said, um, why can't we respect each other? And I, I'm like, we, that's not the starting point for this conversation. You just saw MRAPs coming through communities, M16s, a whole slew of military arsenal, and we're going to start with respecting each other? That's not the starting place, y'all. So our starting place today is going to be what decisions are you willing and prepared to make in terms of what you're going to do about this? And I've had the opportunity to interface with some of you all, so I know some people are trying to do the best they can. But it's going to take a critical mass to move this stuff, y'all. And it's not just about programs and dealing with the low-hanging fruit. This stuff is systemic. It's intergenerational. And it's going to call for some very strategic, coordinated efforts. And it's not just a black issue. It's, what did they tell y'all about what's being created? White folks created it. So that means white people have to take the lead on it. So let's have a conversation. I'm going to tell uh, Patrick and Peter to lock the doors, and we're going to figure this out before we get <laughs> No, I really just want us to have some discussion. That question was posed to me today. I'm chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Climate Committee at the School of Pharmacy. And I really, I'm in a discussion with the chair of my division, I told him that I felt that the whites at our school had to really push the effort for diversity because having me stand there and say, well, this is what we should do, I'm the only African American in the entire building. Mm -hmm. So his challenge to me was how can we do this when most people don't think there's a problem or they're accepting of what exists. So this is the hard the reason I put the, uh, the blacks are criminals is because the psyche of white people, I don't care how liberal, because they've been fed this just like everybody else has. When you look at the, the TV and you look at the news, it, I don't see it as much here because maybe y'all have any black people, but wherever I go and I watch the news, what leads is a young black man who did something and <coughs> that reinforces the criminalization of particular young people and, and black males in particular. So I think what white people have to, have to figure out is how to root out the internalized racism so that they can be a real ally for you. Because it's not your burden to carry. You didn't create this, create this madness. And you're not going to be the one to, to deal with it. So you're not going to be the one who is sitting at the dinner table with folks who got these issues, who say, um, we want our country back. You, you're not probably going to be at those tables. But your colleagues in the, in the office will be. So my thing is, like, you got to give people some tools. You got to give them some information. And we don't need the guilt tripping. That's not helping us. The guilt tripping is not helping us. But for yours, I would say just keep pushing it back on, on other people. Is that your job? Is that your paid job to do this? Well, part that might that might that might change what I'm my recommendation to you. But generally, that is a job 
that you're going to be doomed to fail. I'm just going to tell you like that. You quote me on that one. When you go back to your department chair, say, Jamal Rogers says, if you set me up for failure, because if he thinks that you can be the, the linchpin to make a diversity happen, when you up against people who are saying, there's no problem here in Madison. There's probably those folks who are making like the 100K plus a year, and then in a community where they don't have to deal with poverty, homelessness, none of that. And that's easy. In a community like this was predominantly white, that's easy to do. It's easy to get like sort of getting this idyllic kind of, oh, we're doing fine here. But we're not. The statistics say we're not. And I think any well-meaning, justice-loving white person should be appalled. That's what I hope people leave it. I'm appalled at this. What can I do? Because it's not going to be it's not going to be you, and it's not going to be me. It's, it's going to be the us. So do you have like more information regarding the test score? It's kind of bad. Which which one? Yeah, you, you had information about test scores. Oh, test African scores. American. Mm -hmm. Whites and basically, I mean, they were pretty bad. Right? Yeah. Americans. Well, like, is it because it's the, the way the tests are being worded, or it's a, a bunch of systemic stuff, you know? Um, and again, oftentimes, what happens in public schools, and I can say it because I work them, is like they put a lot of money on the program piece of it, like let's help Johnny read. But there's reasons why Johnny didn't get all of that in the first place. And so so when we talk about uh, unemployment and uh, prison rates, uh, right. you know, all of that is, is part of it. And so uh, so when, when I look at this little, little booklet here, look, ugly statistics, um, somebody's got to get to the bottom of it. And this is not the first year these statistics have been like this. I mean, some of you all been been uh, paralleling and, and monitoring this for a couple of generations now. So that means two generations of black kids have suffered based on policies of the Dane County and Madison schools. Is anybody here from the, off on the school board? So I can fire you up? Okay. <laughs> well, and in fact, the race, there's a woman ran, a Latina woman ran for school board and there was a bunch of smearing going on. And now Alan Mulder is running, and again, there are people are smearing her name for no good reason. So, school board, if, if people go out and vote, you can, you can display that. On, on the roads not taken in Madison, 30 or 35 years ago, <clears throat> when there was a, de uh, a decline of school age kids so, and the decision to close schools. There were a series of schools that were kind of at the interface between the more minority residential areas, and, and those were the ones that were school closed. Mm -hmm. So a segregation problem was created by public policy. Rather than have those be the schools that were seen as the sites where <clears throat> really constructive new programming and new support structures could be most easily done. Mm -hmm. And then it was an effort an effort was to, quote, rectify the problem through what in some ways is a fairly creative busing structure by pairing schools and merging them, which has had modest success in some cases and not in others. But on the, on the sort of narrowly defined school piece of this larger problem, it definitely was the result of bad policy, in part. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's much more going on. But decisions about um, where to de-neighborhoodize <laughs> the schools. Do you know, were statistics a lot better back like 35 years ago? I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Population You know, incarceration rates, um, the incarceration school rates have been fairly stats. constant, I think, for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you said, back in the 70s, they were much less. Mm -hmm. The, but differen you know, the but differentials but here, are always... Here's the thing about this, what this, this uh, Michael O'Hara is saying, he's saying that in spite of the fact that judges here had more discretion than most judges, that we still ended up with, with over-incarceration. Yeah. You know, I understand what that means? It means they had the power to do something different, and they chose not to. 
that's what I'm saying about Madison. Something is happening where you all think you're somebody, but you're not. Y'all nice, y'all nice enough. <laughs> but the statistics don't lie. They keep coming back again and again and again. So I think that's a great point, Eric, that, you know, road not taken and where were people when that was going on, um, what kind of noise was being made, if any. Uh, or people said, well, I certainly don't want them in my neighborhood, so let's shut that down so that they don't. I mean, all of these kind of things are trigger, and they may be unconsciously being thought, but not said. Sometimes they get said, but most of the time they're pretty unconscious. Like decisions that get made, and they look like they might be um, benign, but they're not. They have a racist undergrowth. And there's there's people that have been documenting this this stuff for a while in here. You know, you got all the person in here. You got professors in here that have been documenting this stuff. So when I looked at some of the headlines of some of the newspapers, like, you know, doing some research, they all talked about some of this stuff. So, and I'm saying that because a lot of the young people in Ferguson, and when I traveled across the country, it was like, we are, white people don't get a pass anymore for saying they don't know what's going on. They just don't. Because this stuff is like in the newspaper saying boop, 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 boop. It's all across YouTube, boop, 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 boop. So what, a, what part of it are you not wanting to hear in the deal with? So that's what you have to figure out. And you have to, have to really do some personal work, but you got to do some community work, too. Because in Ferguson, there were a lot of white people who said we didn't know this was going on. All this super exploitation of the courts. Um, we want to do something. No excuse for not knowing. Not in this day and age. Not as quick as Twitter goes. Not as quick as uh, <coughs> stuff is on your uh, internet, on your phone that comes directly to you. So we we, we got we got. I want to hear some more some some solutions that people think we could could work on. Well, I I don't have. I think part of the thing that people face when they hear the overwhelming historic evidence of all of this stuff is that they don't know, including myself, what the path forward is going to be, you know, where you can, and how to choose the right action to take because it seems like an overwhelming problem. But um, I think that I have recently been reflecting, in, to answer your question, and actually go with the prompting down here. Um, I mean, what I've been trying to do lately and thinking about and trying to add on is just that with every sphere of influence that I have as a white woman that has a couple degrees and a couple of roles in the community already, um, to make sure that I am steward the steward of bringing this issue into the into the open and, and being willing to talk about it and advocate um, because I'm a native Wisconsinite. I, I'm many generations from Wisconsin. I care a lot about this state, and I think that everybody should be able to enjoy what I like about this state. And I'm tired of seeing it be a failure in this particular way. Um, and I'm also tired of people of color that want to contribute to the state having to be the ones to constantly be the ones fighting to bring that out into the open. But I also know, coming from a very homogenous uh, Wisconsin community, white Wisconsin community, that people from you know, my hometown, my cousin, um, people that I even am around in Madison, uh, people don't necessarily feel comfortable what, as white people talking about this stuff or knowing how to advocate for it. And for me personally, I just have decided that I might screw up a lot, you know, and I might that might be like hard on my ego or and people might critique me, but that is a small burden to bear in the, you know, the, the overall problem. And I think if white people are not willing to just sort of learn and listen and screw up a couple times and keep at it, um, we're, you know, we're not going to really get anywhere. And that is what I often hear even from people in high levels of leadership and influence, that they don't know how to talk about it or bring it up. And so when an issue comes up and race needs to be addressed in that, 
they just find a different angle on it or something. And so those conversations are not coming from people that have influence. Sometimes I think because of fear, of, of their own sort of, do I know what I'm doing? Do I know how to say it? And, and my position on that would be, it's just like anything else. You've got to learn about it over the long game in a lifetime. And, and I'm not, I don't feel ready to say that I'm an expert in this, but I am willing and prepared to just make the decision to try and fail and, and continue to learn from that process. So is anybody doing something similar, a suggestion that they have how to do this? Because I'm going to tell you, when you say white people are overwhelmed, I'm thinking, how do you think poor black people do this? Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, I'm saying that and to just oppose that the discomfort that people are going to feel is going to be real, but nothing compared to the daily life. And that's the way you have to look at it. Okay, I might be cussed out because I said Negro instead of black, but I'm going to live through this, right? As a white person, I'm going to live through this because somebody will say, well, we don't use that term anymore. But I prefer to be called an African. Some people don't even call, want to be called African Americans. You, so you're not going to get it right all of the time. So you just say, hey, what do you prefer to be called? And move on. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. So, but in terms of trying to look at this big monster that we've created here, and that uh, 45 is doing his best to add more to it, um, I just tell people, pick one thing. Pick one little thing of a big thing and start chipping away at that. Because even if you take education, there's so many layers of bad stuff in education, from curriculum to uh, school culture to, I mean, all, it's just a bunch of stuff. But just pick one thing. So I'm going to the school board meeting every time, and I'm going to be monitoring how they treat the schools that are predominantly black or predominantly kids of color to the white schools. Because I dare say, if that had happened 35 years ago, maybe maybe there would have been some, some outpouring saying, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Not necessarily, because we just had a law in St. Louis that went into effect on January 1 that said kids who fight in school is going to be a felony. From kindergarten to 12th grade, if you have a fight that results in somebody getting harmed, a felony. So the prison is school to prison pipeline is a wet line and well there. And so when we start to see um, the disparities and the achievement gap and the juvenile arrest rates and even, I didn't put in here, but even the, the foster care, I mean, the, the disproportionate number of black kids in foster care, all of that means is going to be a straight line. They take a rocket science to figure out they're going straight to prison. Um. I think I, I struggle with, like, I feel like I've decided to go into a profession that is trying to, like, make, uh, I guess, I'm really interested in community-engaged scholarship in the academy, which is kind of itself subversive, and it's something that a lot of people of color more prefer to do scholarship, which is, like, actually connected to real-world problems, right? Instead of, like, just publishing for academics' eyes only. So I feel like the nature of my profession is kind of subversive and racism within higher education. But I think the difficulty that I have is kind of this disconnect between personal and professional, which I think like concepts of the civic professional help us think about like how you're melding your like personal life with your um, civic life, or sorry, your civic life with your professional life. Um, I don't know, I guess I just feel like, you know, once I leave work, then like, I also have to go to the school board meeting, and I also have to go talk to my family who supported Trump, and talk, unfortunately, I have to talk to them about that. You know, like, I feel like the nature of what I spend 50 to 60 hours a week doing is subversive to racism within a system that has been largely unchanged for 350, 400 years of higher education, and then, like, also then going out and figuring out like, okay, and I need to go to do all these other interpersonal things, that's where I feel like I should, I mean, I don't know, I mean like, confessions of a white person. Like, I don't I mean, what was me, right? Cool. Like, I, you know, I guess, I, I get kind of like, oh my gosh, how much, how much can I push? At some point I have to like, I don't know, that's, that's the struggle that I have. Is kind of I like think you do have to pick your battles. Even black folks have to pick your battles. And then, uh, this is stuff that's coming at you down the side. 
one of the things I've been saying to the, the social justice movements is let's get more strategic about responding to 45 because every day he's going to throw something at you and we can't be running around protesting that, protesting that because we'll be worn out before the 100 days is over. But let's, let's pick our fights. Let's see where we can get some victories. And I say the same thing about people's personal commitment. Uh, if you say racial justice, I'm going to put it at the center. And that's going to motivate how I act in the classroom, with my colleagues at church, at, at, you know, wherever you are, then people are going to get used to you raising those issues. And sometimes, you know, this is the case with me, sometimes they clean up their act before you get there because they already know you're going to raise them. So, um, so it, it helps when they know that that's, that's the compass, the, the racial justice compass you're going to bring it to the space. I also have a question for you because I feel like the nature of some of the work that I do also requires that I con conceal some of this work to where I'm not overtly saying like this is anti-racist, um, especially you know when like you're trying to get Republicans in this state to invest in things like I said that are subversive but they're not like directly anti-racist. It's like invest in community engagement and higher education. And I can get them interested in that, but it's like subversive, and I feel like I have to hide it. I don't know if that's, if that's a tactic. Like that's not good, good bad, or that's, like that's a tactical uh, that you're choosing to, to, to use a tactic that's going to work for them. I don't think that that's an issue. Because one of the things we found in Missouri, we had a, a ballot initiative where the Republicans were going to change the state constitution to start eroding voting rights. And so Amendment 6 was going to do voter ID and have all this other stuff. We were able to beat it down in the urban areas of Kansas City and St. Louis. But in between there, which is basically rural, we, we, we lost that one. But partly we lost because we just didn't have enough boots on the ground. Because the people who were going to those rural folks and talking with them, when they had a chance to, to do the engagement like you were talking about, those people say, oh, yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't know what's coming. But we just didn't have enough time and money to do that. So I think the, the conversations with people are, are really critically important to have. Um, the one-on-ones or house parties or whatever. But uh, no, I don't, especially the rural, because I've noticed that uh, in Wisconsin, they use rural and the rural and urban dynamic like they use black and white in Missouri. So they can't say Madison, the black folks mm -hmm. getting all the goodies and y'all not. They say these liberal, mm -hmm. high-paying public sector folks are getting all what y'all should be getting. So they really are pitting rural white folks against the urban white folks. So yeah, so that's, that's an issue that needs to definitely be dealt with. So if you're going in those places, more power to Some other strategies that we can be using? I want to take it back to the beginning of this conversation. Because <clears throat> you lay out a definition of racism mm -hmm. as, a, as a relationship with power uh, and cited institutional power. Uh, the conversation here is going toward individuated, mm -hmm. uh, what I consider non solution. Mm -hmm. um, the question you raise in, in your statistics is why Madison is the way it is. And there's very little analysis of that. And for some of your some of us said, look, this is a company tax. The company is the University of Wisconsin. Uh, more lately, a smaller company called Epic. Right? If you're not in some way, shape, or form connected to or benefiting from that com those companies don't matter. And the company, historically the University of Wisconsin, is incredibly underrepresented in terms of uh, people of color uh, at all levels. So if that company is not desegregated, okay, uh, then the town that is affected most by it will continue to display all of these disparities uh, for, that we have. So it's an observation that some of us have had for a long time about there's no power structure analysis of Madison. 
last one that I know of was done in the late 1970s. Right? Who's who? Who governs? Who rules? Who, who's the money? And who, are, when you say, you know, just, you know, who are the decision makers? Uh, institutions, not necessarily individuals. No, I think that's an excellent point, and maybe that could be the next workshop that folks are doing. Because one of the things that I find interesting about uh, universities like this is that uh, they are, in fact, microcosms of the broader society. And so, uh, so I always encourage students to, like, you know, cut their organizing teeth right here, because there's going to be some issues here that you need to be organizing against or for. Um, but I think it's interesting, like it's like 40,000 students here, that, that's, that's a, lot, a lot of folks, that's a lot of folks. But oftentimes, you're right, the university is a power player, sometimes they don't even have to be in a room with their power player. But you know, they, they can be targets like any other corporation. So I don't say that they need to be left alone. And I also don't necessarily think dealing with people's individual uh, issues is um, a negative, because this really, uh, this whole struggle is about the hearts and minds of people. Uh, because if you can't get them to, to understand the system at its grossest level from, from here, then they're not going to do anything. So we got to vote. But where the real change is going to come is at the systemic level. So we need to be moving people in the direction of doing something to change those systems of oppression. Another hand back here. Following on this point of student activism, um, one of the really great bright spots, of course, is this sort of upcoming generation of leaders. That we've gotten a great place to see that is in um, the university's student government. The, the undergraduate leaders there are absolutely amazing and to see them work. Um, they recently passed uh, the Movement for Black Lives platform calling for reparations in the form of free tuition for black students, which generated a lot of attention. I haven't heard a lot about it on, on campus, but you know, if you need ammunition to say, well, we need to be tackling these issues, um, say, well, students are demanding it. Their, their elected representatives are demanding it, and they're just incredibly inspiring um, as a group. Um, so, one thing, another thing we can do to support that organization is that currently the governor's budget calls for prohibiting the university from collecting fees that uh, that fund that group and fund the Black Student Union and a bunch of other student services, um, probably in reaction to some of the stances that this, the, the you know the students are taking. And so um, there are phone numbers to call if you want to say that you no, know, our students should still be able to um, fund student organizations and. and make decisions like that. Um, and then uh, as a side note for those of us that are graduates and faculty, every single department of this campus should have our articulated plan to desegregate our our, our departments, right? I mean, these hiring decisions are made at a department level. And I know my department doesn't have a plan, and I, I assume that a lot of departments don't have a plan for how they are going to recruit more graduate, graduate students of color and hire more faculty of color. And, and that plan should be articulated, very clear and transparent to everybody. So, um, just a couple of things for us. Wow, uh, that, that would be a handful for everybody to have to be plan. But you know what? The uh, I was in communication with the young man, Tariq, that did that. And, uh, and then I told him, I said, did you see the, the comments that were made when it was posted that he was asking for reparations? They were very ugly. Very racist. Very, I mean, very, very nasty. And so, so these were from folks on campus. So, so when I look at comments like that, I don't necessarily get um, perturbed or upset because what it is is feedback in terms of what work needs to be done on campus. So I hear what you said about the up and coming young leaders, and I meet them all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I met one that is doing the work here around help me catch it around making sure that the university is not using sweatshops to make the little badger outfits Student Labor Action Coalition? Hmm? Student Labor Action Coalition? Yeah, the Student Labor Action Coalition. So they've already been able to uh, get some concessions from the university about, you know, where, this, where these, uh, these 
garments are going to be made. So I know folks are doing stuff, and they probably, that's going to carry over to her working, and in fact, she actually became uh, an organizer for the union. So, so there's, a, there's definitely places, uh, interventions that students can be at, and this is, like I said, this is a microcosm. So you're seeing racism in its, all its glory here, sometimes not as much, because one thing about universities, y'all, they, they got lots of distractions for you. They got lots of busy stuff for you, so you don't ever have to go outside of, into the community. You just stay here and in your little bubble. But some young people are refusing to do that. And so that's, that's a good thing. The hand right behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to build on what was brought up just before um, and talk a little more about reparations, right? So um, if we think about democracy as something in this context that is built on the seizure of labor and resources from um, indigenous people and enslaved people, right? So then the model of reparation takes place both on an emotional spectrum and in terms of physical resources. And so it needs to happen on both of those levels. So in terms of the emotional stuff, I mean, white folks need to learn how to process their shame and we need to learn how to hear critical feedback and the comments that you reference, I think, are an example of um, the sort of difficulty of processing these challenging things, right? And so I think that um, something that's been helpful for me is to be involved with organizations like Groundwork, where white folks are holding space for other white folks, to be able to move toward racial justice um, and not do so in a way that's traumatizing for people of color who also have to be in the room with us. Um, so that's, that's one resource that I want to encourage folks to check out. Um, and then the other one is the organization Freedom Inc. is amazing. Um, they're Madison-based. They're working on a lot of um, a lot of reparation-based work, um, and also on equity for uh, gender minorities and Hmong and Black folks in the community. Um, and they are actually starting a capital campaign to be able to buy their own building. Um, so that's a very, very concrete way in which white folks can plug in is by, if you're really busy, if you're swamped with emails, being able to donate money to Freedom Inc. so they can buy their own building and take on the kinds of projects that need to happen within their communities rather than, you know, white folks trying to swoop in and save everything. So those are a couple of the things that find helpful. I also know that we're trying to get somebody who has this over here. Yeah. Um, these are all wonderful and important comments. I think it's important to try, to the extent we can, to join the question of racial justice with class. 43% uh, of poor people in the United States are white. And they're, and they're poor in part because of racism, because of the way racism has blocked uni more universal programs in the United States, which would be broadly alleviating of the levels of inequality. Now, this is not to displace the question of racism onto the question of class, to say that it's really all just class. No, of course not. But frequently there's discussions around racial justice that don't continually emphasize the way that race is itself reproduced by its deep connection to class inequality. Uh, and that connection, if it's brought always to bear on the topic, helps to then build coalitions among poor people. I mean, the, Martin Luther King called it the poor people's campaign, right? And for good reason, because he saw natural allies between um, marginalized and poor and oppressed whites and blacks, and the effort to keep that division alive and intensify it is, of course, one of the hallmarks of American history. So it's not simple to bring those two together, of course. I'm not, but the, the, they need to be conjoined. Um, and fundamentally, that means defeating politically the forces of neoliberalism that uh, think that poverty is a good thing, that marginalization and inequality are desirable. They keep people in line. They promote particular forms of competitiveness that uh, should be opposed, et cetera. So I think uh, 45 was going to make it easier for that to happen right. with people in class and race intersect. Because when I see a, a poor white person who thinks that they have some kind of affinity with Trump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, again, feedback for work to be done, okay? 
but but I would also say that because poverty, things like poverty, drugs have been not just racialized but criminalized, then white people who need those support services, because it's always been said that's for black people who are lazy trifling and don't want to work, and when you actually need it, then you feel some kind of hesitation about, well, I don't want when that's what it's supposed to be there for. So I just think those kind of conversations have to happen. So I'm, 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 I'm all for race and class. And I, and I think they can be confused. Because I was in two community meetings today where I and, I, and I totally agree with everything you said, but I also saw white people wanting to say, but I think it's about class. And I'm starting to hear that as a way of, let's talk about white people again. <laughs> so just, it's very complicated. We have to keep the complications all in the same way. And so how do you suggest dealing with that when you hear it and you know that's what's happening? What, what's your Well, if there's time to, to go ahead and look at how poverty is related to other issues, too. Yeah, it's, it's that whole thing of taking the responsibility mm -hmm. and not just letting somebody say that. But it, if it's slipping away from talking about racism. Well, I, just if I may mm -hmm. just say one little thing. I think whenever there's an opportunity to frame solutions in equality as equality solutions, in addition to being specifically focused on race, to bring those two issues together, it's constructive. Uh, <clears throat> rather than <clears throat> exclude, imagine that you could you could solve the problem of racial oppression and racial marginalization strictly by dealing with race. That's not feasible. It's just not going to happen. The only way to deal with it is you know, as Alex said, dealing with power, but also dealing with inequality that's a correlate to power. I was just going to respond both to you about equity and diversity committees and someone back there who was talking about don't play, don't, shouldn't departments have plans. Well, I'm retired now, but a number of years ago, we did have plans. That it's, I was in the School of Education, I was head of equity and diversity. And what we did in recruiting, for example, is two members of the committee would meet with a search committee from the department, and the dean wouldn't sign on the, to the search until it was clear that they were doing their advertising and recruitment in the ways, and the, you know, the advertising itself, I mean, the, the way the description was written, in the way to maximize the broadest pool and to get a really diverse pool. And they didn't. A lot of people didn't like it. They called us the equity police, but the searches were much better. We got a lot more faculty of color who were really outstanding that they hadn't been looking for in the right places. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of other things like that going on, but I think everyone backslides. Mm -hmm. and, and our the thing we had done in our school, a lot of that was institutionalized throughout the campus, like exit interviews when anyone left and the faculty and a lot of academic staff, the, our committee interviewed individually with complete confidentiality unless they wanted to share something about why did you leave. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot about climate issues mm -hmm. at the university mm -hmm. and tried to make changes. And it just becomes routine and people don't think about it and they're not doing the job anymore. I don't even know if the equity and diversity committees used to meet regularly to share ideas. Well, they do. Be. But then, um, Patrick Sims, the vice provost, um, has monthly meetings with uh, representatives from the yeah. Equity Diversity Committee. Um, what I'd like to comment, I feel in many respects, sometimes when it comes to hiring, there's a power issue. And unfortunately, I, I feel that often, uh, the efforts made to reach environments where you would actually recruit um, faculty of color is avoided in the attempt actually not to recruit. Because there have been moments that I felt <coughs> that some of my colleagues felt that if I wasn't in that position, that one of their friends would have my position. So if there's not that many African Americans or students of color at a particular school, they may feel, well, why do I need a faculty member of color? But more recently, there was um, two African-American students that were interested 
and um, the School of Pharmacy, and they ran into me. And both of them embraced me. When they saw me in the hallway, they were like, wow, you exist. And I got uh, emails from them later um, thanking me for, for working with them. So I think that it's a matter of education on my colleagues' part. They are used to seeing people that look like them. But for a young African-American, Latino, or Native American student, to see someone in a faculty role or some other position gives them motivation and they feel like, well, I can make it. I might be comfortable in this environment because this person is here. And the other thing is your dean needs to support you. We have complete support. And I think that makes a huge difference. So it's a power structure again. And it shouldn't be on you. You should have a strong. I think on that point, it's, for me, it's about building the coalition of the willing. I'm from Southern California, and it's very diverse, and it's not here, and that's a hard adjustment. And when I recognize that my personal place and purpose is here because of what you just mentioned about being a leader and an advocate and a supporter of like, coming students, I mean, it's a numbers game to some degree, right? So we need to build that coalition of the willing and, and wait for probable to play. So for me, it's this balance between uh, consuming to produce. So what information am I consuming when I look at my bookshelves and think about what perspectives and what topics are represented? How can I diversify that? So that's like it's an ongoing quest for being mindful of what I don't know to then produce questions at leadership tables to say, have we thought about this? Have we talked about this? Have we heard from students on this? So on and so forth. And I think it's really about pushing people to be uncomfortable and to be familiar um, and perhaps comfortable even with being uncomfortable um, in order to continue to ensure that we're being responsive to our changing demographics and to the various needs of our students over time. I have a saying that, you know, the best time to prepare for war is in times of peace. And I've been in a couple of circles where people are talking about Madison being a sanctuary and that's all good and well. Uh, that you've had that that uh, history for a very long time. But one of the uh, concerns that came up is the, the communities that may be under siege when this stuff starts coming down for real, are they going to know the white people whose houses they're going to be asked to go into? Because there's been almost no relationship building with that community so that they, they may feel comfortable like, when it's time for them to hide or it's time for another another family that's coming through there to go somewhere else to hide. What, you know, what's going to be there? What kind of relationships are, are people have, have built uh, for those folks to feel safe in terms of emotional security, not just physical security, but emotional security as well. So I just think there's a number of, of, of work that can be done. Some people have spoke to what they're doing. Um, but I, I really want us to go back to that, that power analysis in a minute here. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, your sort of comment about like, the, the coalition building between like knowing who are the same people to talk to, uh, maybe even over this. So I'm, um, I'm from Arkansas and moved here for grad school and eagerly anticipate returning to Arkansas. Um, <laughs> so I, I have, yeah, that is, I've had my own sort of internal conflicts about my racial identity living here. Um, that is a whole other story. Uh, but I, I remembered a conversation that I had with um, a fellow graduate student who's from North Carolina, uh, and his view, and he's white about his his view on racial relations here, and it's like, yeah, in the South, white people might say that they hate black people, but they're friends with black people, so you have that, like, you know, the collective versus the individual. Whereas here, white people might be like, oh, black people are great, but you don't know anybody on a personal <laughs> level. Um, and so, and I have found that, and I think it's part of just the, like, Madison is this liberal utopia where everybody is very, nice. maybe not everybody, the people that I've met in my social circles are very okay with having these difficult conversations and consider themselves both white people, but when it comes to like actually taking the steps, they're, they're like that, is, like that is not happening from what I've So what do you think it would take to get them to move from rhetoric to talk to action. I yeah, I don't I, I really don't know because it like it is the people that are reading Michelle Alexander and Tana Hasi Coates and that are, you know, very socially aware of the broader 
you know, conversation. But I think it's a level of, of personal comfort that people aren't necessarily having to get over, um, of, of not having that personal relationship. And it's also like, I myself am not like representative of an entire people and uh, can't speak to like the African American experience in Wisconsin because it's not my experience. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that. But. I, I'm wondering if everybody in this room who, who, who left saying, I'm going to make racial justice um, center to my life and in every space that I'm in, uh, I'm going to find ways to raise it. Uh, I wonder what kind of impact that would have on Madison from the standpoint of obviously there's places where people can hide and continue to be safe. And it's easy to, to talk or quote Michelle Alexander and like you said, never have any interaction with black people or know what it means to have a family member who's in prison and what that means for your life. Um, but what I'm saying is what what if we are making the room smaller in terms of being able to find comfort so that wherever people are, there's going to be somebody there saying, that was racist with, you know, such and such, you know, the policies that are coming down in this university are going to disproportionately affect African American students. That somebody is going to be there raising those issues as opposed to a safe haven for white liberalism. I think in response to that, I think this is also where we as individuals have a responsibility to ask, okay, I'm consuming, I'm consuming stuff, information, all this, but to what point, to what end, for what reason, right? So even this, um, what Gavin had said about community engaged scholarship, I think a lot of these things really are in heavily, heavy alignment in the sense that I want to give back and make impact now, whether or not I have a degree yet, whether or not I have, um, you know, tenure, whether or not like X, Y, and Z, these are things I typically, because of the culture of academia, would have on my absolute priority list. But this and this and this, community engagement, social justice, like these pieces are really critical to me and I have a capacity to make impact now. So I would push your friends on consumption versus production. Like it should be a balance. Or what's the point? Um, I just wanted to give another opportunity for people who are interested in doing something after this conversation. Uh, there is a campaign called the Racial Justice Tipping Point Campaign, mm -hmm. and the idea is to get 3.5% uh, of Wisconsin to sh sign up and show up for racial justice. Um, if I were a good organizer, I would have had the sign-ups with me, but I have the website. Um, and so we've already done, uh, we launched last May, and we've already uh, trained 300 um, folks in Madison, uh, Milwaukee, and uh, Fond du Lac, Appleton. Um, so it's not just Madison, but other places. And the idea is to, you know, have the skills to be able to show up um, in spaces and to call for racial justice, but also to um, connect to campaigns for racial justice demands. And so you can go to uh, www. Oh, we don't do that anymore. Racial Justice WI. Org um, to sign up and to get involved, and there will be more trainings coming soon. So, Claire, what does a success story look like? I from, from the trainings that have been done, and people said, because of the training I got, here's what I did in this space or in this situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, more people are coming out to events. Um, people know how to, do, how to do outreach and talk to other people. Um, people are leading neighborhood conversations on racial justice and getting their neighbors involved. Um, so that's been really exciting. But I, I still feel like what success actually looks like to me is when we win demands. Uh, when we um, stop incarcerating people for crimes of poverty in Madison. Uh, when we're not throwing money into an, uh, a new jail in uh, Dane County. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think are the concrete demands, but I am <coughs> feeling enthused about more people wanting to um, show up and talk to their neighbors. Okay, got some sharing going on here. That's, that sounds like a good, good program. Maybe I can come to one of these. Um, I think part of the other side of this white political bubble too is also 
disavowing supporting libraries, you could say. And I think people have different capacities for emotional labor. Um, but those who have family members, or even on social media, there's been like this kind of like complete severance in some ways. I've had a small anecdote. I've had people ask me to unfriend people who have ideologically far-right views or whatever, and I don't agree with them at all. I feel like that sort of polarization is itself very conservative. And for those who um, can bear the, bear the brunt of it, talking to people who, you know, <laughs> so to speak, like, I think that's, I think that's important in that case sort of, like, in a way, shunning the worst of our own reflections in some ways. I've seen that and it's in terms of um, whiteness. And so just having an openness, even with any sort of darker elements, <laughs> because it, it is the lack of communication that is itself, you know, shuts down that love. I think that, uh, like, every time I'm about to, like, give up and say that's not the role that I want to play, because, you know, um, maybe 40 years ago I might friend of mine said, you need to talk with a clay in person and be able to convince them. I just, I just I don't spend my time doing it. Um, but there's other people who, who can and will. And just recently there was, a, you all might have heard about this, where the son of this like grand wizard ended up befriending the, uh, the black guy. Mm -hmm. And y'all know about this story? Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me, because I'm, I'm a mess well, I, I, I just know what you're referring to. I think I watched the documentary. I'm talking about public TV about this. Um, it, was a, it was a black man, right, that went and talked to all these reflect like, clan members. But, he did, but they didn't, they ended up befriending him, but they didn't, a lot of them didn't change their position. But this one guy did. He actually denounced his dad. That's the one I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, he was uh, in the storm front. And he was dean of the New College of Florida, and through the friendship he made there, um, I guess that it changed apart quite drastically and disavowed his, his, his father's plan and views and his kind of outspoken remarks. So, so those, and I'm saying that to say that those kind of conversations are, could be powerful for folks who, who had the patience to do that. And these folks did, and they, they became, you know, friends. So think about what that means for your dad, who's a grand wizard, to have his son denounce him publicly, because I think it was a press conference and the whole, the whole nine. And so, because uh, then it may be some other people in the clan who feel in the same way, and maybe that would give them some some, some emboldenment to, to do something. So yeah, those conversations are important. Well, I, I have a question about, um, well, I'm, what you just said made me think of another question in terms of that kind of work. Like, how worthwhile is that work really? Because when I always think that when you do political work, if you're working for um, social justice and racial justice, you're taking a stand. You're saying, this is where I am. And, uh, and if you think of racism as being uh, systemic and structural rather than changing an ind individual by individual, is that work really valuable? Is it really valuable for me to talk to, to um, <laughs> you know, strong Trump supporters or someone that looks like a plan? I don't know if that, that's one question. And then uh, another question I have is, um, you know, a lot of people do really, you know, there's, there is, I mean, you can talk about dismantling racism, and there is, there, you know, there is, Racism, which is systemic and has existed, I suppose, ever since Europeans came over to this country, uh, or existed here. I don't know about the rest of the world. It's existed here ever since Europeans came over to the country. So there's this, you know, we kind of are swimming in a sea of racism. This is a question. I have no idea what the answer is. So you you have a lot of people that do a lot of good work towards the problems that racism creates like education and mass incarceration and all that stuff. But my question is what, um, you know, if we're all swimming in the sea of racism and people of color are, are, you know, drowning in it and white people are swimming and maybe even benefiting from it, 
what what is it that you mean in terms of something systemic or structural that that oversees stuff or something in terms of so this is sounds way. like you're talking about a silver bullet. No, not because I'm trying to figure out what one thing is going to deal with all of this. Not a silver bullet, but a. Um, because I envision that even though people do wonderful work and things change, that if you're swimming in a sea of racism, you're going to be swimming around from thing to thing forever. Uh -huh. You're going to be swimming around, you know, doing something about education, doing something about um, mass incarceration. But if, it, if we still live mm -hmm. in the sea of racism, I, I don't mean a silver bullet, I mean... Okay, I, I understand your and, question. I think what, what people have been saying about the structural and systemic Racism is the place where we want to be, but that's a process as well. So the thing that Claire is saying about these folks that are getting trained, hopefully at one point when we say we're not going to build any more jails in Wisconsin or, or Dane County, that they will be people who will be a part of that. And you got to keep your eyes open because what they'll do is, it's kind of like a guacamole thing at the carnival, like you, you get them to say no, and then like two years later, they, they do it somewhere else. But I just think that people have to understand the system and as opposed to the, the water that's coming down the, the river and you're at the end of the river and you're trying to deal with the, 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 the stuff that happens there, you're gonna like put a dam up here at the beginning so that the water doesn't even come down. So we're trying to get to the source. We're trying to get to the roots. And that's I think that's the hard part for people to realize where and it goes back to the power analysis, like who, who has the power to control and who has the power to make the decisions that's going to change this thing. But it's really the people who have the power. Because even though this university is here and it's got power, they're beholden to taxpayers, students, you know, they, they, have, they have some folks that they have to be responsible to and accountable to. So we, we got to make everybody accountable wherever we are, wherever they are. Um, so I don't think, I think it's harder to deal with the systemic stuff because folks are so entrenched. And I can say this about even Ferguson. So people think it was like this the longest ever protest. Afterward, the backlash was so severe and so ugly <coughs> that you would think that probably nothing ever happened. Except that people's attitudes, black folks' attitudes definitely changed because it's like, this is, we're never going to put up with this stuff ever again. But you know, we had 40 pieces of legislation around um, court reform. One of them passed. Two months later, a court overturned it. So, so we know about systems change. So we're able to use that and say talk about systems. So, yeah. So I just think that you know we have to use teachable moments, but mainly we have to say here's where the power is. We don't even need to be messing down here. Let's go here. The people got to be prepared. They got to be a strategy. They got to be a plan. All of that. You can't be marching up on somebody. They think you're gonna holler your way into this stuff. It just won't happen. Well, I don't have any answers unless you count magical thinking as an answer. But I think the problem is ignorance. I think white people are really <coughs> ignorant of the black experience of American history. And I was one of those people. And I, I. I you know, went on a journey over the last several years to, to educate myself as much as I could. And, you know, I just wish that everybody did that. And, you know, the university is in a position to be able to facilitate that. Um, but when people say um, they don't think that there's a problem, you just, like, they're just so ignorant. And um, so, you know, if I could just make one wish that would be that, that people would be more learned about stuff that happened in the 50s and those, those choices that were made, you know, mm -hmm. housing and... Mm -hmm. um, and they're still being made. I mean, um, when you talk about ignorance, I sort of look at ignorance me and lack of information or lack of knowledge. And so, uh, so one of the things that's very easy for white people to feel is that in a situation where there's police violence, there must have been something that that black person did. Because the police in my neighborhood don't, wouldn't ever do that. Mm -hmm. That's legitimate. But what's not legitimate is somebody tells you that that's their experience and you challenge <coughs> or deny it. <coughs> what you can say is that doesn't happen in my community. <coughs> I, I would never accept it happening there. 
But some of this stuff is a daily occurrence. The stops, <coughs> the frisks, the, the assaults, the uh, degradation, it's, a, it's, it's daily dosages of it. It's current. And so when I jokingly told people it was two weeks before I saw a police car here and I was trying to figure out what's going on in this place. Um, because in the community where I live, I'm under occupation. So I'm going to see a police car every 15 minutes, half hour. And I'm going to see police cameras. So my, my existence is very different. But I don't want you to say, well, you all are doing, again, blacks must be criminal because that's why all this stuff is happening. And so in my community, that doesn't happen because we're not criminals. So I, I just, I can understand why people could be in that little bubble, never have to deal with that. When I've seen police officers here, they're helping people. They're asking, can those would be white people if they're helping. Yeah. 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 They're very but, helpful to us. Right. Right. And there's photo office, really. But, you know, my point is that I think it's easy for people who live in all white environments to have a different reality and pull them out of those environments or even get them to be exposed to something different without them feeling like, well, something is not right with those people. Because I do challenge white people. I said, when you pass by, a night court, and you see all black folks getting in the line around the corner. Do you think, as you're passing, wow, well, look at all these criminals breaking the law? Or do you say, hmm, it's a disproportionate number of black people that are being stopped by the police and given these tickets? Which one do you think? <laughs> I don't want you to answer that now and incriminate yourself. But think about it. <laughs> So what I'm saying is that there are situations that have been set up where people can actually feel like that's different from my reality, and it's actually true. So we got to get people out of the comfort zone. I think we're ready for a couple of more questions, and then we're going to. So uh, you said earlier <clears throat> that the uh, the excuse on behalf of white people, well, I didn't know, is no longer valid. I agree with that. Uh, up until recently, I didn't know. I'm from a small town in northern Wisconsin. We had six black people that I'd ever met in my entire life. And then I came down to Madison. Uh, currently, I'm a lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and I work with young Marines that are of all different ethnicities. One of my best friends who graduated from this UW's NROTC program with me was the only black uh, officer to go through this program in I don't know how many years. Uh, now we're working together in California. So. I didn't ever really notice any sort of disjunction because the the black people in my community were upstanding. They were athletes. They were they were popular. Um, and I as like how how politically active should a 13 year old be through through 18 year old? Probably the answer is a lot more than we were, but uh, it's getting better up there, I think. Um, nowadays, though, when I'm in California, I don't see any sort of racism on a day to day level. I'm not saying that there's no uh, occurrences of racial discrimination in the, in the military in general ever. Of course, that'd be ridiculous to say, but it's on the officer and staff to uh, control it and put a stop to it when they see it. And uh, I was ignorant uh, up until a little while ago when those riots started happening and I started paying attention because I was no longer in my northern Wisconsin bubble. I had gotten out to the east coast, the west coast, and I started seeing different things happening that didn't really sit right. And I, I'd like to think that that would mean that the majority of the population in the United States, if they get outside of their bubble, they can choose for themselves what would be right and what would be wrong. And like you said, sit in on a school board meeting and police the, police the enforcers of those rules. I'd like to think that that is possible to happen. Um, moving on from here though, you, your original question I think is what are, what are we gonna do about it? I think that what should happen is we need to hold our, our leadership accountable because that's what we would do in the military is if somebody was allowing something to happen, they'd be, there'd be an inquiry right, over, right away, they'd be kicked out uh, and wouldn't be able to leave. And I know that that's really what the point of uh, whatever the, the group you talked about, girl with the purple notebook, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was called, right? You, you want to hold your leadership accountable and uh, so in answer to your question, what am I going to do about it when I go back and I'm more politically active, I will sit in on those meetings and I will listen for what sounds right and what sounds wrong. Talk to your friend too about what his experience is. His experience was rough. He uh, yeah. came from a very poverty stricken family and he lucked out and got the full right scholarship here. Yeah, you can learn a lot from him. That's true. I'm, I'm thinking though, um, 
because this is a, a we're in a university where there's lots of research, lots of data gets thrown on, and year after year things like this keep coming out with very little change. That's what I'm saying has got to stop. And I don't know if there's a group, for example, here whose only purpose is to deal with educational equity and, and lowering or, or closing the achievement gap, or if there's a group whose sole thing is dealing with uh, over-incarceration. But those are two things that y'all got to get a handle on, mm -hmm. got to. I'd just like to branch back around to the title of the talk tomorrow, which is why dismantling racism is important to democracy, is that it? Mm -hmm. It's central to democracy. And, and democracy is a system of governance, like you said, majority rule. And so what we're talking about is a numbers game. And in a state like Wisconsin, the, um, I mean, just to make clear the obvious, it has to be, if we're going to do anything democratically, it has to be the white people that push this, just because of the numbers. Madison, 6% African American. Dane County, 13% African American. It really can be no other way. So in, as someone who made a decision to run for public office, to hold uh, folks accountable, and to get into that power system to do something um, about this, it's really difficult, even for someone in a position of power, to, to bring that kind of accountability without a movement behind one. So, that, and you know, in an economy that has been built on the um, you know, dispossession of land by Native Americans and dispossession of labor, centuries of it, of African Americans, I mean, the wealth of this country was built on those two things. How, you know, how do we even begin to start picking that apart, right? And, and there's a basic level of political education just about that, that that people need to understand and to feel responsible for changing, um, I think, if, if we're going to get anywhere. When I hear white people say, telling black people to kind of you know, go back to your land, I'm like, they are. <laughs> yeah, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> if one's going to go back, it's going to be you. But So yeah, it is some basic kinds of information and, and education that needs to be done. You had your hand up. I was going to make you the last one. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I'm just going to say that this piece of, that I keep resonating to a lot of this, and partly it's because we're in this academic space, but I feel like all of it's from our shoulders up. And so there's a lot of thinking about this. There's a lot of, I need to know more. I've got to have facts. So, and I think part of what I need to do and we need to do, particularly as white folks, is to feel some, mm -hmm. something. Um, and, and that's not a magic answer for, you know, systemic change, but it's a place where we have to start in, a, in this, in the honor place of feeling. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. That's why I say this is a struggle about the hearts and minds of the people. So it's not just the top of us, like here too. Because uh, if we can't feel for our, uh, a citizen who doesn't look like us, who doesn't think like us, whose gender is different, all of that, then you know, then the enemies continue to like pick all of those rural, uh, uh, urban, uh, straight, gay. Uh, it, 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 it goes on. And religion, Muslim against Christian. I mean, they they got it all worked out, and the divide and conquer is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty powerful strategy. So yeah, so I think that sometimes I see that as a cop out too. Like, I need more information. I need more information. You've been thinking about this for 20 years, bro. Let's get with it. Come on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. 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 So, sometimes a little information can be dangerous, but somebody who's said back there, just get in there and start doing it. People, will, people who feel like you are sincere are going to lovingly and gently correct you. And it's not going to be like, it's going to be, okay, she's, she's with us. She's down with us. That was a mistake. I've actually heard. Uh, some gay folks jump on uh, another gay person. So we, it's just some, uh, some issues out here that we just got to deal with. And so some of the, um, some of the uh, stuff that gets thrown at us is still all there that we have to sort through. So we're actually doing double duty. We're trying to, to fight these folks, and then we're trying to 
to have some unity amongst ourselves, and that's like a real job to like sort through all of the isms that that are that are amongst the good folks. Uh, so yeah, so I, that's a good end, end to to talk about winning the hearts and minds of people because it's going to take both of those. So Patrick, you want to close us on out and redo the our, uh, upcoming events? So. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm.